Good morning. Thanks for coming out. Uh, I was going to say at 10, but at this point it's like 1020. Um, sorry. My name is Philip Martin. Uh, I am the CISO at Coinbase. I've uh, been at Coinbase about three years. And um, out today. Uh, yes, and apparently I am too tall for the microphone. That's fine. Um, what, what we're going to talk about today is a is really a follow-on to a blog post we released yesterday, but um, is we're going we're gonna to talk about an attack from what I think is one of the most dangerous attacker groups in crypto today, in cryptocurrency today. Um, the the attack specifically targeted uh, cryptocurrency companies, around about twenty different companies, including us. Uh, it leveraged two different Firefox O days uh, in uh, in the execution of the attack, as well as a really extensive social engineering phase that we'll get into as well. Um, and we're going to spend the next you know, 50 or so minutes till you kick me out of here. Um, sort of breaking down the attack, how it went down, uh, lessons we learned from it, indicators we took from it, what we know about the attacker, um, and uh, and whatever questions you guys have at the end. My expectation is I'm probably going to get more than normal amount of questions at the end of this. So I'm going to try to leave like at least 10, hopefully 15 minutes. Um, and if there's not that many questions, I'm just going to talk some more. So ask questions. Um Let's talk about that. That's me. I do things. I've done, done things other places. We don't need to dwell on that. Um, so, you know, it's like I told you when I start sort of breaking down the attack, give you, I'll give you a high level overview of sort of the, the way I, I'm, I'm breaking it down in terms of phases. Um, I doubt I'll just caveat this. I'm going to say it later too. Um, well, I'm going to break this down in terms of sort of phases of the attack. I doubt the attack, the attacker thought of it the same way. And I doubt it happened like that in terms of the actual timeline. Um, but I'm chunking it up so we can like talk about each piece discreetly, right? So the timeline makes it look like it all happened one after the other. I doubt that's actually true in the real world. Um, we'll, we'll talk about sort of what the, our detection strategy, why we, why we, why and how we detected it. Lessons learned, a little bit about the attacker. Um, so let's get into it. So that's the quick overview. Um, the the super high level discussion of this. Thanks for reminding me to put my phone on silent. Um, is that uh, an attacker attacker group? Um, it's it's known in, in non English reporting. because It's been from reporting in Polish and Japanese on this group um, that they call Hide Seven. We track them as as Crypto Three, so the third in our serialization of of, uh, of actors. Um, put together a list of about two hundred people, all for the most part in crypto. Um, sent out a really elaborate social engineering scheme. Um, that was that was involved with Cambridge and a couple of academic prizes that they award. And like I said, we'll go into that in depth. Um, they winnowed that list of 200 down to about five that they actually wanted to exploit. They delivered a Firefox O'Day uh, to the, or two Firefox O'Days to those to those five, um, which then delivered a, a, a two stage sort of malware setup. Um, they went through this traditional sort of recon pillage with with phase two being a more full featured rat. Um, we think this is the same actor that breached CoinCheck. We think this, this actor has been active in, in Asia and Eastern Europe for quite a while. Um, this actor has dropped over the course of their lifetime that we can that we can see, which goes back to about 2016. We think this attacker has dropped about six O'Days of various quality. Um, so obviously well-funded, well-organized, like they know their shit. So let's, let's break this down a little bit. Um, I was going to do a really fancy like set of I'm going to fade everything else out and make the, that the one bright. If you ever try to make opaque squares in Google Google Sheets I'm, or Google Slides, I'm so sorry for you because it is such a pain in the ass. Um, so phase one recon. This is, this is the phase we know the least about um, in terms of how, what the attacker did and what they were looking for. Uh, we know that they put together a list of about 200 people in the initial target set. We know it was it was concentrated in America and uh, EMEA. It was a little a little bit of targeting in APAC too. Um, we know they, for the for the for the majority of of the targets, they were right. They were involved in crypto. There were a few where they were just dead wrong, and they had literally nothing to do with with cryptocurrency. Um, they seemed more interested in IT, infrastructure, security, engineering for obvious access reasons, um, but but were willing to take any foothold they can get based on based on sort of action that they, they took later. Um, what do we not know? We do we have no idea how they sourced their data, zero at all. The the email addresses they're they're using are personal email addresses. They weren't really using much in the way of corporate email addresses. 
Um, like I said, they got they got the list right. Uh, my my suspicion is they were using classical OSINT techniques. They were looking at names in, in news reports, things like that, using that to then develop further information about it and specifically dig up personal email addresses to bypass corporate controls. Um, but we don't actually know that for sure. We don't know how long this recon phase lasted. We don't know if they were just sitting on a portfolio of people that they wanted it, they wanted to breach, or if they got it all, got it all together. We don't know if if I, I might have phase one and two switched. They may have acquired the O'Day before they, they put the list together, right? Um, we just sort of don't know exactly how that played out because that's this is the phase we have the least visibility into. Um, so next phase, sort of weaponization, right? Um, and this is this is a really, really rich topic area. Um, and some some really, really interesting pieces here. Exploitation. This is this is a pretty rich rich topic area. Um, I've lumped in, into this sort of both the exploit dev as well as what I would call sort of the infrastructure prep that the attacker did. Um, and, and we'll go through sort of both of those things. Number so, um, there were two O'Days leveraged in, in this attack. Uh, CV 2019, uh, 11707, and 708. Um, they're both Firefox exploits. One is, a, is, a, is essentially a JIT exploit, and the other is a sandbox escape uh, from, I feel like I'm stepping on a cable here, uh, from Firefox. The net result of the two is a, a zero user interaction uh, O'Day and Firefox, right? Pretty, pretty awesome. Um, so CV, uh, so 707 was, a, was a simultaneous discovery by a researcher at project zero, uh, named Samuel Gross, uh, and the attacker or whoever the attacker acquired this, this, uh, exploit from, um, Samuel has a really good write up on, on Twitter about sort of the differences between his approach or between like the, the way they discovered it, uh, and the result and exploit that they wrote. Uh, and what the attacker wrote, the, the TLDR of that is that uh, we think that, that the attacker found it a very, very different way than Google did. Google found it via fuzzing. The attacker probably found it as a variant of another existing O'Day uh, CVE 2019 uh, 9810, uh, which was disclosed in uh, in April of this year. Right. So based on the based on the similarities in those two types of bugs, what we think was happening was the attacker was looking for that that same pattern bug. Uh, or potentially as a, uh, potentially just a straight variant of of ninety eight ten and ran across this bug as well at, at about the same time. Um, the 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 second bug is actually way more interesting. So so eleven seven oh eight was a was a novel discovery by the attacker, never before seen. Uh, sandbox escape in Firefox. While the the underlying mechanism that was used in the attack has actually been in Firefox for years, um, the specific way this attacker chose to trigger it had only been possible since May twelfth. Right. So so what does that imply that 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 implies the attackers had about a two week discovery to weaponization cycle, which is insane. Right. If you've ever tried to write an exploit for something as complicated as a browser on a, on a platform like Mac, two weeks is just crazy fast to be able to get that out the door. Right. Um, and we know this because we saw the attacker starting to set up infra, setting registering domains, things like that on about May on about May 28th is when we think the attack the, the attacker started to get set up infra because they're setting up infra we're assuming that means they had the oday or at least they were almost done with the oday otherwise why go to the effort if you if you uh if you don't know what you're gonna what you're gonna do with it um sorry i'm, I'm going a little bit faster than i'd planned to because we we're, we're a little bit tight on time um oh right the the talk about the came so the cambridge side of stuff um, is really interesting too. So the attackers gained access to two accounts uh, at the Cambridge University uh, professors accounts. Well, more a little bit more on that a little bit later. Two accounts, two email accounts, legit Cambridge domains, um, and they used the, those email addresses in, or those accounts in both the phishing. So we'll see examples of this later where they were sending from legit Cambridge University accounts, as well as to host pieces of the the actual exploit pages themselves they didn't host the oday on cambridge that was in a separate domain but they hosted all the lure pages everything else one of the things that cambridge does for for people that have accounts is you can you know the the old school home directory right tilde username right after the top level domain they make that available when you have an account so the attackers leverage that uh, as part of the overall social engineering process you'll see some of the links they used when we talk about the phishing um, but it really, really, really improved their ability to fool their targets uh, quite thoroughly. Um, we don't know a ton about the Cambridge side of this equation. We don't know how long the attackers were in. We don't know if they used it for other attacks. We don't know. We don't know if, if the accounts they used were uh, or actual user accounts or they were just completely fake. 
Um, we've, we've done, we did a fair bit of background on this. The LinkedIn profiles we think are fake. Uh, so they, they backed these accounts with like LinkedIn profiles and, and other data. There's no other results for these names. Like we think it's probably uh, the attacker had enough access to create these users, but we don't know either way. So the delivery this is my favorite phase. Um, it's my favorite phase because the level of effort we saw from these attackers on the social engineering side um, was, in in my experience, extraordinary. Um, we'll we'll see this in a second. The attackers took on average uh, ten days to two weeks with with the victims from the first contact all the way through a non-malicious phase of social engineering until they winnowed down the list and figured out, do we care enough about you to give you a zero day until they finally actually delivered at the far end. That took about 10 days to two weeks, right? Because they were responding on like normal human timelines. It was, they weren't doing like automated responders or cut and paste stuff. It, it felt looking at the, at the email threads, it felt normal. It felt like a human. It felt like an academic responding back and forth. Um, so let's take a look at that and what that looked like. So this is what the initial outreach email was. There were two versions of this. Um, so this one, this one references the uh, the Adam Smith Prize, which is an economic prize, economics prize that uh, Cambridge awards to. I think it's post postdocs, I believe, uh, on an annual basis, um, and it's specifically specifically focused on, like I said, e economics. Um, a couple of things to note about this. I'll use this example because it's it's better colored. That link you see right there. Number one, note that it's going to that that this user's homepage or home directory, not a top level Cambridge site. Um, two, that link is entirely benign. There is not a malicious bone in that link's body um, or in the resulting web pages. Nothing. It is a pure copy of the Adam Smith Prize page that you can find on Cambridge. Right? Pure copy. Nothing. Nothing changed about it. Um, the second phase. So you, you respond back. You say like, oh, "Great, this is amazing. I'm going to do this. This is so cool." Oh, well, first I'll show you the the Adam's Prize variant. Um, so different name. Uh, same pattern, right? So you, you, you follow back up, say, great, I would love to do this. It sounds amazing. Thank you so much for reaching out. Um, and you get something like this back, right? So thanks so much for your reply. There were a few variants of this that, that we saw. Um, but but basically, if you, if you reach back and said like, yep, this is awesome. I love math because reasons, um, they, they said this. Um, if you if you responded back and said like, hey, I'm in marketing, dude, like, why are you emailing me this? They ceased contact immediately. Um, really, any reply other than, yes, this is right down my alley. This is amazing. The attacker ceased contact immediately and just moved on. Right. And keep in mind, of course, up to now, if if you were a normal user and you said this, like, there's nothing suspicious here. This is an email from. Uh, from a Cambridge University account or referencing a Cambridge University, Cambridge page, the most suspicious thing is I wonder how they got my name, right? So far, so good in terms of OPSEC with these attackers. So a few days after that, what you would get is is, is this. Um, you would get the, the, the and in some cases, there were a few more back and forths uh, based on like specific questions and answers. The attackers like engage wonderfully. You'll note throughout this entire thing, good grammar, good writing, um, like they're using reasonable punctuation. Uh, this is not what you expect on a normal sort of like uh, low or even mid quality phishing. So this is the actual exploitation is where it starts, right? So that, that link there, that's malicious. That link is the link that hosts the, uh, that, that sort of does the final checks and, and hosts the actual O'Day or, or links to it at least. Um, like I said, so from tip to tail, from, from this to that 10 days to two weeks, for for most for most recipients, right? Um, so so really really high effort, very high quality, like nothing super weird about this, right? So at this, at this point, they're saying like, okay, these are the specific projects we want you to, to review, log, view it, log in. This goes to that link um, is actually copied again from Cambridge University's actual website. It's their IDP login page that the attackers uh, stole, right? Um, and at that point, once we click there, we talk. We start to talk about exploitation, right? Um, so there's two small changes to to that to the, the the website that the attackers made. Number one, they included this, right, which is just saying if you're Mac, if you're using uh, uh, Firefox on Mac, you're good to go. Um, the the bit about if you're using anything that's not a Mac 
we think is uh, while we looked when we saw this code, we looked and said, do they have more exploits? Are they exploiting like other shit, too? That'd be really cool. Um, we we don't think so. Uh, we think there was only one exploit. We think that that was more around OPSEC than it was around target selection. So that a person who visited on Windows, right, is going to see nothing really weird. The username and password won't work because there's nothing hooked into the form on the back end. But it's like, oh, that's weird. I wonder what happened, right? Um, as opposed to if you're on Mac, now if you're on Mac and you're on Firefox, uh, or sorry, if you're on Mac and you're not on Firefox, what you get is this, right? Oh, so sorry, your browser's not supported. Uh, please install Firefox and continue, right? And almost to a person, every person who actually passed, went and installed, installed Firefox and passed this step said some variation of, oh, I just assumed it was a weird academic thing, right? It's a university. Universities do weird shit all the time, right? It's hundred, almost, almost to the person. Um, that's, that's what, that's what folks said. So you go ahead and do that. Um, and you visit the site and then this is the second thing they changed. Um, they injected that script at the very, very bottom. Um, that's the actual exploit code. Um, well, that's the reference to the file that contains the actual exploit code. Um, we're not releasing the O-Day yet until more and more, more and more users, uh, get on upgraded versions of Firefox and users are slow at patching. Um, so, so analytics fit is a user is an attacker controlled domain. Um, this one was registered on, on the 28th of May, so right before the campaign started. It does nothing but host this uh, this JavaScript file. It's not involved in, it wasn't involved in C2, it wasn't involved in anything else. It's just nothing but host this. Let's see. Um, so, sort of, I'm, I'm lumping together for so the exploitation installation C2. So, so you visited that, your browser was exploited. Um, it was a nice, clean exploitation. We didn't we didn't observe much in the way of crashes. It seemed quite stable. Um, what happened is your browser would shell out to curl, uh, download stage one, That's right? So stage one um, was a variant of the NetWire family. Um, while it is technically a a full fledged rat, the attackers seem to use it for uh, mostly recon, uh, basic pillaging, and then deciding if they care enough to to, to send stage two down the wire. Right? Um, stage two is a variant of Mox. Um, this seems to be the attacker seems to use as a, as a full fledged rat. Um, we see activity indicative of hands on keyboard, right? So at this point, we're not talking automated exploitation. We're seeing somebody somewhere behind the computer telling this thing what to do. Um, the one of the one of the, the difficulties as we advance out of this and, and into sort of actions on target uh, is that it took us about. So, so we, we got our, our alerts um, essentially, essentially here, right? So when the O-Day landed and, and, the, and the shell to curl happened, we started getting paged um, by, our, by our alerting systems. Um, so the attacker was only active in, our, in, in a place where we could see them for about 20 minutes, um, tip to tail in this incident. So they didn't have a lot of time to do post-exploitation activities where we could see them, um, pluses and minuses there. Uh, we we have had some access to other systems where the attacker was there was, was present longer, um, but we don't have like, you know real time EDR style logs from those. We have sort of dead box forensics from those things, so we don't really know everything we we would we would hope to know about what the attacker was doing after the initial breach. Um, but we do know a few things. Number one, we know that they went after browser stored credentials, including session tokens. Um, they pivoted, interestingly enough, they pivoted from the endpoint into the cloud. Uh, we saw several times, right? So from the endpoint, stealing session tokens, stealing credentials, using that to go into email accounts, online file storage, um, other cloud-based services was a thing this, this attacker particularly seemed to like. Um, we saw a bunch of other weird stuff on a few on a few endpoints, like applications the user didn't recognize that were suddenly installed after the, after the attacker showed up. But again, dead box forensics, it's really hard for us to start talking about like intent and what the attacker was actually trying to do with that. Um, there is a fair bit of, of uh, Japanese language reporting on these attackers. So um, it, we released a blog post earlier today, earlier yesterday about this as well. It references it references this. Um, the I'm gonna I'm gonna forget the name, um, but the Japanese CERT basically uh, published a really in depth write up that goes much more in depth into uh, some of the techniques that these actors are using. Um, and uh, uh, really starts. It's one of the ways where we're we're sort of assessing these are linked uh, actors. Is all the similarities we saw, we saw in the TTPs there. I feel like I'm stepping on something that's like half broken, which is why this is happening. 
So let's talk about the attacker a little bit. Um, number one, based on based on sort of open source reporting, we we think they've been active since about 2016. Um, we think, uh, we, in fact, we know they're not covered as a named group by any of the threat intelligence companies that we've talked to. Um, some cover them as like unknown or, or unattributed groups in some ways, but but no one has sort of named coverage of this group. Um, we think this is the same firm that breached CoinCheck. Uh, that's so the Japanese language reporting I was referring to was specifically talking about the CoinCheck breach. Um, overlaps include the use of academic emails as phishing, the same malware, the same kind of uh, of lures and patterns in, in how they were reaching out to users. Um, this we think this group, lastly, has dropped at least half a dozen O days since 2016, um, which when you think about it is actually is quite a few O days in the last three years. This this Firefox O day was by far the most interesting of them. The rest were like O days in RAR or things like that um, that were used. You know, they were much harder to operationalize. We think this is the most interesting O day we've seen evidence of them dropping. Um, but what this says to me, and this is why I said it at the, very, at the very beginning, I think this is the most dangerous attacker group in crypto today, um, is, a, is a well-funded, organized, the, the skill sets we saw displayed in that exploitation chain. Uh, that's, not, that's not someone somewhere alone, right? That's, that's a small group between the social engineering and the infra and the ODAs and patching it all together. Um, that's a small group. My guess, like looking at the code, looking how it was structured, looking at the short development timeline on the ODAs, is that they bought the O days, they didn't. They, I don't think they developed them. I could be, I could be very wrong on that. I'd say that's like low confidence statement. Um, but because that cycle was so fast, and because when you look at the code, it's nice, it's modular. Um, it was done by somebody who's, I think, used to building these things before. Um, that makes me suspect that we're dealing with a, a brokered O day as opposed to an internally developed O day. But if that's true. That means, and these guys have done six O days in the last in the last three years. That's a very well resourced organization to spend that money for those capabilities. All right. So very very scary attacker, scary scary attacker group, um, and not not well tracked. So response. Um, so shock. We did not we did not leverage uh, magic cyber AI to detect this attack. Um, there were no blockchains involved in this attack and detection of this attack. Um, nor, nor was there any, any machine learning. Um, this attack was detected uh, with essentially behavioral rules, right? Shit that just shouldn't happen. It turns out Firefox should not be shelling out to curl. Um, it turns out that files probably shouldn't be executing from temp. Um, it turns out uh, unknown or, or in this case, unsigned processes shouldn't be touching .ssh, .abws, .geniapg, uh, shouldn't be touching the keychain, right? These are, these are behavioral alerts that literally any of us can write. Um, the other, the other reason we detected this is because we're fanatical about visibility. Um, we, we treat endpoints that don't have security tooling, like, like endpoints that have unpatched major vulnerabilities, right? We, we focus heavily on hundred percent deployment of our, of our sort of visibility infrastructure. Um, and that I think pays dividends broadly. Um, the other reason so that's why we sort of detected it. That's how we detected it. Um, the reason it was a 20 minute to containment incident for us is because we're fanatical about practice, right? So the, my, the, the thing I tell the team all the time is if you can't do it drunk at 3 a.m. on Christmas morning, you can't do it <laughs> flat out, right? Um, we don't practice it like that, although there have been, there have been some proposals. Um, but, but seriously, this means, this means playbooks. This means practicing. This means knowing your tools. This means finding the edge cases, finding the bugs in practice before you find the, uh, the bugs in reality. There, when I, so I was in the military for about a decade, and the saying we had was, the more you bleed in practice, the less you bleed in war. Right? Same concept here. Right? The more problems and bugs and just things you find in practice, the fewer you're going to find when, when it actually counts. And it's 3 a.m. Christmas morning, and you're, and you're drunk. Um, because that's not when you want to find bugs, right? Um, the last thing, and, and really, really, this is this is more on the lessons learned side, is that if anyone in cryptocurrency was laboring under the impression that an o, a, an o day is not actually in your threat model, and I will upfront say for most organizations, o day is not probably not in the threat model. If you're in cryptocurrency, o days are in your threat model. If you're not already planning for it, you should be today, um, and you should already have been. 
Uh, and, and this means, right, when you talk about days, we're talking about layered defenses, we're talking about consistency, we're talking about high quality execution, playbooks, practice, making sure that you know what to do and can do it at a moment's notice. Um, or you can do it when someone's on vacation, or you can do it when two people are on vacation, right? Um, without calling that person on the beach in Hawaii and saying, hey, can you respond to an incident? Because no one is at their best responding to an incident on a beach in Hawaii, promise you. Um, a couple of other things I'll highlight, um, and I think I blasted through this and I'm going to not delay the, the rest of the, uh, the stuff too much. Um, a couple of other things I will highlight is interesting here. The use of personal email was particularly interesting uh, as, the, as what the attacker targeted. Um, the, the intent was clearly to bypass um, controls on corporate email. Great. That makes sense. The consequence, though, was that we saw several cases where targeted individuals um, you know, fell prey and, and downloaded everything and compromised their personal endpoints. Um, in addition to potentially corporate endpoints, right? Um, from a corporate incident response perspective, this is a big problem for me, right? Not only do I lack visibility on those endpoints, it's not always totally clear that the user even is, is going to know that they're compromised, right? And for most people, you know, not everyone has great hygiene about separating work from private life. Even if they do, that kind of access can be leveraged in, in follow-on phishing campaigns that will be much more effective as they're coming from these personal and well-known email addresses as opposed to, to something else, right? Um, so that, I think, is, is an interesting thing. It, uh, again, you know, we, we, talk, we talk about this in red teaming a lot, right? The, an actual red team can't go target your personal life. An actual attacker probably prefers to, right, because of a lack of controls. Um, with that, as I, I'm going to leave about 10 minutes for questions, I hope it's been useful. Um, what I'm, what I've tried to do, try to leave you guys with is sort of a view into this actor. Uh, they are, they are an actor to watch. Um, go read the blog post. We reference the reporting. Um, if you can read Japanese, that's even better. Uh, if not, I'm sure it's going to get translated at some point soon. Um, if you're in cryptocurrency, you should be looking at this actor. Uh, and then just a few notes on, you know, practice, practice, practice. I think security is about execution more than anything else, right? Um, with that, happy to have your questions and thank you all for your attention. And sorry for the AV issues. <laughs> Go ahead. Maybe I missed it, but I don't believe you said the name of the group or one of the code names associated with it. Hide, uh, so I think I said at the very, very beginning, it's Hyde 7, H-Y-D-7, H-Y-D-S-E, the word 7. That's what the Japanese reporting calls it. Um, we track it as uh, we use. We don't use the the fancy names. We use just numbers. We track it as Crypto Three. Okay. And how did you spell that again? Which one? H Y D S E V E N. Okay, thank you. Yeah. What's up? You showed some JavaScript snippets up there. Yep. Um, like linking to the OD and stuff like that. Was that obfuscated at all in the browser? No, it was not. Um, there was almost no use of obfuscation, at least on the on the JavaScript side, uh, in these attacks. Which is which is nice because then we were able to do things like look at the structure of the JavaScript and like make draw draw conclusions or at least form opinions uh, on that stuff. Yeah. So one, one quick point, no question. Um, the only failure I noticed in the um, social engineering is the phone number was wrong. Yep. Because there was a Greater London phone number and all the came which goes through one two two three. Yep. Um, it might be interesting to see if that number has been used somewhere else. No, um, it is not. Uh, so the question was, um, you said that they were looking for. Um, in browser tokens. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's very popular these days to have browser deferred stored session tokens, either your application delegates or, or others in OAuth 2. Yep. Is there any indication that this is a generalized attack for basically getting at all cloud endpoints or, 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 or targeted? Um, how do you mean generalized attack? So, so I would I would say it's part of their. Yeah. Going after a cloud wallet or something that's more blockchain y, um, obviously using that, you could also get it off of Oh yeah, yeah. So, so just to clarify, they we saw no evidence of them going after the blockchain specific accounts. It was it was all about email, file storage. It, it was all about that stuff. Yeah. So this is clearly part of their post exploitation TTPs. Like this is just part of their playbook. It'd be my guess. Yes. I mean, they only delivered this O-Day to like five people, just to be clear, right? They, they started with 200. 
Um, they wintered it down in in the in the in the emails, and they only pick about five to deliver the the O'Day link to. This was not mass exploitation. This was highly targeted. They were not they were not after your wallet. They were after they were after my wallet, uh, quite frankly, in the context of Coinbase. Let's turn that question around. If they were after MetaMask, would they have bought it? Um, I don't know enough about how MetaMask stores data, but my guess is yes. Sir. No, so it was a it was a broad um, broad swath of cryptocurrency companies. Um, so about twenty different companies were involved among the two hundred people. Uh, we we have relatively limited visibility into into some of this stuff. So we know we know they threw them at uh, at least one of our users. Um, we know they threw them at other users, not not at Coinbase as well. So no. Absolutely not. Um, so because they're, they're looking at browser token theft, right? So they're not stealing your credentials. They're stealing your session token, right? So you've already logged in. Um, even if two factors in place, it depends on your two factor, right? And, and when, what, what exactly you're using. So, so they're not, they're not like, this isn't credential phishing. This isn't something where they're trying to impersonate you per se. They're on your, they're on your system. They can steal your session tokens. They can, they can steal your cookies. They can impersonate you in that way. Um, but even more than that, right? They're they're more than likely. Had we let this intrusion continue, what we what we would have seen was internal network pivoting um, and seeking out internal systems documentation, like fairly standard post exploitation stuff for a group like that. Sir, how long have they been funded? I don't know. Um, we think we we think their attacks we can we can attribute back uh, open source attacks we can attribute back to them back to 2016 or so. Um, we think they did the coin check breach. Um, in this attack, my guess is if they bought that O'Day, they spent between half a million dollars and a million dollars on that, depending on lots of factors. Um, but like I said, this this group is I think under researched, and there's not enough light on them really for me to have for me to be able to say, sir. Yeah, uh, in regard to threat intelligence, do you work with in the industry to like share stuff like this? We do. Um, so I mean, a when this happened, we went public with it immediately. Um, shared the hashes, searched on the IPs, um, and and we uh, look. I'm not I'm not Mandy. I'm not CrowdStrike. I make no money from having private threat intelligence, right? Um, I get I derive all my benefit from sharing this intelligence as widely as humanly possible. So hence, hence this basically, and hence hence uh, the work we do directly with with other cryptocurrency organizations. Um, yeah, sir. Yeah. Well, in this attack, I don't believe I don't believe they made any money on this attack, although I could be wrong. Um, there may have been other organizations that lost the lost funds to them in some way or shape or form. Um, so so in this attack, they again, this is this is my guess. I'm guessing they spent between half a million and a million dollars putting this attack together. Um, so this was this was a loss to them. But um, if they're the ones who did the coin check breach, they got away with about I think it was five hundred million dollars in NIM, the sum of which they they were actually able to convert and and take take with them. They've been active in cryptocurrency so long that my my assumption is they're essentially self funding at this point. Um, and like the million dollars they lost here was like, we took a swing, we failed. We'll do better next time. Yes. Can you share any details about your run book after you got the alert and how you responded to it, especially when there's so many potential things where session tokens could have been stolen? Yeah, so so fortunately, um, the attack was highly targeted. It ended up on one one endpoint, right? Um, so that we were able to a go the, the the general shape of that is we went we went broad and then deep. We said, okay, here are the indicators. Here's the malware. Here's the hashes. Here's the IPs. Is this present anywhere else in our in our entire ecosystem? No. Outstanding. Let's take it. Let's take a much deeper look at this. Um, so we were able then to pull the endpoint logs and say, okay, what files did these processes touch? Which is which is how we can gain certainty on like what they were getting access to before we quarantined the machine, and then based on that we said okay they probably got these things we don't know if they exfiltrated the data or not before we quarantined so let's just roll all those creds, um, and and move on from there. We were also able 
um, thanks to some quick action from the incident response team. To, this is how we, we pulled the, the ODA code directly from the site, right? Before they knew we were responding, we had detected and were responding. We were able to set up um, a, a pre-existing VM a, analysis VM infrastructure um, with with Burp sitting in front of all the connections. Go pretend to get exploited, just like the same user is clicking on it from another device, basically. Um, and it happily re- tried to re-exploit us, and we happily snagged the the uh, the zero day from there. And then reported it to Firefox. Actually, I, I forgot to give Firefox a shout out. They were incredibly, incredibly great in this entire process. They got um, the first. They got the 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 um, uh, the first O day was patched the the either the same day no the next day. Um, the second O day was patched the same week. Um, the first one they'd already been working on a fix on. The second one, they 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 went from never before hearing of this thing to shipping a patch in under a week, right? Very very impressive. They were they were a joy to work with, sir. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna share the slides later, um, and then of course we have we Ripple and and and, and us like happy to happy to share whatever else you want to you want to hear afterwards. Yep. All right. Um, I I actually don't want to share that quite frankly. So so the. The we do use an MS, MSP for for tier one. Um, we also do independent detection on that same data feed um, for for stuff that we feel is more targeted to us. Maybe maybe last question or no? Outstanding. Thank you all very much.